folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggart coming to you from Studio 2014 with another Watchmen video broadcast. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. We've been dealing with powers here lately, and I've been dealing with the last couple weeks um, chemical sorcery. I've been dealing with, for, for the last several Watchmen broadcasts, on witchcraft. The relationship between witchcraft and what we've been talking about as far as chemical sorcery, you're going to see it from the Word of God. I've been laying out a case of what's going on, what people are saying, the attitudes and the ideologies behind those who are promoting drugs. And we have governments doing it, promoting drugs by saying, ah, smoke them, smoke them if you got them. We have uh, industry promoting drugs. We even have religions promoting it. I'm going to show you the, relig the religion of cannabis. In fact, take a look at this graphic here. S cannabis spirituality. We've been talking about how marijuana, that, and that to most people is what they would refer to as some mild drug. Does it make you climb the walls or whatever? But it does lower the alpha state of your mind. Remember that from last week. Lowers the brain waves of your mind, gets you to, it's called an entheogen, it gets you to look at the God on the inside of you. So we have religion promoting drugs. And we're going to see the connection between that and witchcraft as we finish out this series. I'm going to read you a verse, and I just, I just saw this in the Word of God. Galatians chapter 3, he uses the word bewitched. Someone had bewitched them, had brought them over from a certain mindset, set upon the Word of God, and what Paul's, do Paul's doctrine was, you're saved by grace and not the works of the law. That was Paul's doctrine to them. Someone came along and convinced them, one way or the other, that it wasn't that way. It says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth. What was the purpose of it? The purpose of it was to get these people to stop believing the truth. Truth, in spite of what you've heard from other people's truth is not subjective. Well, it's this person's truth or it's their truth. I've heard that statement before. Well, they're just wandering and walking in their truth. But Jesus said in John 17, thy word is truth. The words of the Lord are pure words. A silver trod into the furnace of earth, purified seven times. This Bible is truth without any mixture of error in it whatsoever. And this Bible lays out the doctrines by which you and I are saved. But there are powers out there that will stop at nothing to convince people. Let's follow the trail. The, the real gospel is what we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's that number four. Uh, and that gives you the, the idea that the sins of mankind have been atoned for. They've been paid for at the cross. Christ uh, went into the heart of the earth to preach the gospel. He ascended on high. And now he is the intermediator in, or the mediator between God and, and, and mankind. That is the, you believe in that. You trust in that. In the finished work of Christ, that's the gospel. There's the other gospel. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, spiritual wickedness, and high places. These four are always going to try to fight these four. Always. And so Paul said that someone came in there and bewitched you. Oh, who can we dig up here? We have, um, here we go. We have Joe Smith. I don't think that was his real name. Okay? I think he just made that up. Um, we have Joe Smith who was given another Testament of Jesus Christ, and this book contradicts this book. And so, and by the way, Joe Smith, before he became this godly prophet, uh, uh, lesser only uh, to than Jesus Christ and God. In other words, there's nobody else that's over Joe Smith other than Jesus and God. Okay, before Joe Smith became the head and founder of the Mormon Church. He was a necromancer. He cast, he, he was a, uh, a seer, a diviner. 
He would look into the future or he would see things that no one else could see. He was a practicing witch is what he was. And so the witch came around and bewitched all of his followers to where they stopped believing what was in here and replaced it with this. Same thing with A Course in Miracles, all right? They quit believing what was in here, and they were bewitched by devils and by spirits to stop believing the truth of the Word of God. Watch this now. Let me show you how this works. Here is, let me get my books all straight here. Here is the New King James Version of the Bible with the Triketra on it. Well, that's the Trinity. Pastor, don't you know anything? I know that God said in the book of Acts that we're not to have a symbol for the Trinity. He said, we ought not think that the Godhead can be graven with art and man's device. It's a witchcraft symbol is what it is. All right, now I get the video called the Triple Helix, and I'll tell you what that symbol represents. But you know what this book was for? You know what this, the new King James Version Bible, you know what it was for? It was to get people to stop believing this one. Same thing with the book. Oh, I just kind of like this one better, and I read it because it's more easy to understand, and it has less words in it than the King James does. The purpose of this is to get you to stop reading and believing this. And, and I'm just, I'm going to say it like this. I have the mindset that anything or anybody that causes you to doubt one word out of this book, that's witchcraft. They're trying to bewitch you to make you think that something in here is not right. Let me read that again. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? And so whatever convinced you to go away from this book as truth, it's witchcraft. They cast a spell, as it were, on those people in those churches. And Paul was, I mean, he was ticked. He was upset. So what do we have now in the 21st century? We have this new spirituality. Whether it's brought on by transcendental meditation or Lectio Divina or contemplative prayer or whisper prayers or Jesus prayer or uh, this is one I'm hearing a lot, soaking prayers. You heard that one? That's no more, soaking prayers are no more than contemplative or whisper or Jesus prayer or Lectio Divina, the, the divine lecture where you repeat mantras over and over. Ex do exactly what Jesus told us not to do. Do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. Don't pray that way. Don't just keep saying it over and over and over again. Jesus knew what, what door that was going to unlock and we talked about that last week. He knew that. So whether it moves in by way of meditation practices or from a chemical induced altered state of consciousness one way or the other that witchcraft is causing people to not believe the truth of the Word of God we uh, left off last week with this idea of mystery Babylon this part of our brain taking over this part of our brain now I'm going to show it I'll show you what it looks like and the reality of, of spiritual ideas moving people away from the static, immovable, unaltered Word of God. Have you ever heard of Rastafari? You ever heard of that one? Okay. You may not have heard the word, but I almost bet you that you, um, you've seen people that practice it. They're the ones that they let their hair grow into dreadlocks. It started out, um, I think, uh, was in Jamaica or somewhere around in there. Anyway, the idea of Rastafarianism, basically, here's their gospel. The gospel of Rastafarianism is that they believe that the, the former emperor of Ethiopia, um, Halle Selassie, or whatever, however you pronounce his name, they say that he was Jesus Christ come back from the dead or coming back that was his second coming. So they worshipped him as Jesus Christ. They called him Jah, J-A-H, which is actually in the King James Bible. But they called the emperor of Ethiopia Jah. They call him the Christ, the Messiah. And they believe that he was the lion. And if you take a look at the graphic, that's what that's all about. Okay? They believe that he was the lion 
And they got their ideas and their religious impressions and their thoughts about this emperor of Ethiopia being God. They got it by way of what is one of the basic tenets of Rastafarianism. Well, I didn't hold it long enough. I'm telling you, I just, I never smoked any of this stuff. So, but I've seen people do it, all right? I watched Cheech and Chong movies a long time ago. But anyway, part, the basic principle of Rastafarianism is that you have to smoke marijuana so you can gain access to the spiritual realm. When I say that cannabis and marijuana is a gateway drug, I'm not just referring to the fact, to the fact that those who take hardcore drugs like methamphetamine or um, you know, heroin or anything, cocaine or anything like that, where did they start? Marijuana. That's where they started. Most people, if they're going to be honest, that have taken hard drugs will say started out what it started before marijuana. It probably started out with beer at a young age, then went to marijuana. And then that wasn't satisfying enough. So it goes harder and harder into these really nasty drugs that you can't get off of. So when I talk about it being a gateway drug, I'm not just referring to that it's a gateway to other drugs. It's a gateway drug in that it um, puts down the truth of the Word of God and it exchanges it for spiritual concepts and spiritual ideas that come into the mind of those who blow their smoke that comes through the mind from seducing spirits and devils who teach doctrine. You're not going to find this idea in the King James Bible. It's not there. Oh man, we don't believe the Bible. The Bible's got God in a box. We, oh now I know who God is. You see, what ha you see what's happening? That this, this, that, and this is why I really believe that all of these states now, they're not doing it for humanitarian purposes. All of these states now are changing their laws on marijuana. Why? To create an alternate society and to create an alternate religion. Now, again, part of the idea behind Rastafarianism is that they all smoke marijuana. They got to smoke the marijuana in order to be, connect with the God. There's another part of Rastafarianism that I think is very, very interesting. And this kind of goes to what we were talking about last week, about the creative side versus uh, the logical ordered side of your brain being in charge. When I got up this morning, I uh, took a shower, and after I got out of the shower, you know, your hair is wet and you dry it, and it's all sticking up everywhere, okay? Looks like a rock and roll star or whatever. Um, I took a comb that has straight lines on it. And I plowed rows inside my unruly hair. I made it ruled. Get it? I made my hair in order. Before I, before I turn the camera on, whether I'm doing a Bible study or anything like that, I, I got a mirror in here. It's right over there. You can't see it. And a comb. And I put rows in my hair so that my hair doesn't look disheveled, so it looks like it's in order. Rastafarianism basically says, uh, in order to honor our God, we have to bear the mark of our God. We have to grow the long hair. And they can't just grow long hair. Took it, I remember finding out how people got dreadlocks. I'm going, how do, they, how, do they, how do they curl their hair that way? What do they do? They don't do anything. They may wash it. But other than that, they don't do anything with it. They let it grow. And you never comb it. You never put order to it, ever. And it, isn't it interesting that when you don't put order to your hair and you're going to grow the dreadlocks, they twist around each other like two serpents. Remember what we've been talking about? The whole uh, cosmic serpent deal? Okay, that's what it does. Coils around itself like two serpents winding themselves together like DNA, all right? So, and then they let it grow real long. They've got their locks hanging out, all right? I'm going to show you what that looks like in the scriptures. To get this, here's a Rastafari, uh, Bob Marley.
Bob Marley, reggae player, most of his music was based upon Rastafarianism. And this guy's worshipped just about everywhere, all right? So Bob Marley had the face of a man, but he had long hair in curls and locks like a woman show you what it looks like. Revelation 9, 7. The shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads was as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of who? Lions. Their teeth were as the teeth of lions. I get it. Rastafarianism seeks to look and appear like what? the gods that are buried underneath, down in the pit, that, here we go, watch this now, take, take a look at this picture of Bob Marley again, okay? The gods in Revelation 9 that come out of the smoke. I'm going to show you more of that here in just a little bit, all right? Now, let's look at the connection between marijuana and the awakening or the opening of what they call in the New Age terminology, the pineal gland or the third eye. Here's an article. The pineal gland or the seat of the soul as described by Rene Descartes is the focal point of our spiritual guiding system which makes us go beyond the five senses of rationality and become multi-sensory. Tuned into and aware of higher dimensions of consciousness with a holographic cosmos. Cannabis or marijuana among other psychedelics facilitates the activation of the pineal gland and turns on the third eye or the mind's eye directing our spiritual evolution to wholeness. Did you get that? It goes from one New Age guru to the other. And again, the witch doctors, the New Age people, they'll tell you there's two ways basically to open up the door to the devils. They don't call them devils. The masters, the spirit guides. There's two ways to do it. You can either train yourself to meditate and it takes years to learn this. Or, just take a drug, okay? Now, uh, Huxley did it. Timothy Leary did it. Francis Crick did it. John Lennon did it. John Paul, Ringo, George, Ozzy. They all did it. They all took drugs to activate their third eye so it would be open, so they would have a new knowledge or a new awareness where does it let me show you what that looks like here Genesis 3 and the serpent said unto the woman ye shall not surely die for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil remember what we just read here O foolish Galatians who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth here was the truth the logical truth given to Adam the man. God telling him, here's a tree, here's a tree, this is the tree of life, you can eat that all you want to, here's the tree of knowledge, good and evil, don't eat of that tree, and if you do, you'll die. And it's all black and white here. There's no misunderstanding this. It's black and white. It's right and wrong. It's on, it's off, it's up, it's down. It's logical. Obey the word. There's one rule here, Adam. Do whatever you want to in the garden. There's one rule. Don't eat of that tree. For in the day you eat there, you shall surely die. So now here's the devil going to, not to the, not to the man, but to the woman. Visualize this, Eve. Visualize this. And so she's looking at the fruit, and she's imagining in her mind that the, the fruit looks like it tastes good. Okay looks it, it it would taste good fill my belly make my belly feel good things that's the lust of the flesh that fruit just looks beautiful that's the lust of the eyes if i eat that fruit then my third eye the serpent said look at the verse the serpent said to the woman you shall not surely die for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. I believe that that eyes being referred to here is the pineal gland, the third eye being opened up into a new awareness. But the devil bewitched her into not obeying the truth that her husband gave her. So she starts imagining what it would taste like, 
imagining the beautiful color of it, imagining how she would be after she ate of that. Why? She would, have, she would be a god. So she ate it. And that's the idea behind what marijuana, what all this new consciousness is. It's to get men to follow not the Ten Commandments, not the static, unchangeable Word of God, but to open up their pineal gland into a new awareness, a new consciousness, a new way of thinking, so their eyes could be open and they could be as gods. Now, going back over this again very quickly, all right? Um, you and I right now, hopefully, I know I am, Doing this video, you're watching it, hopefully you've not had anything to drink in the last, I don't know, 10 years, in the last 24 hours. You're watching it and you're sober, all right? So you're taking in the information, and remember what we related this to, all right? Here is our consciousness, we're able to think, we're able to critically look at things. The devil's not coming up to us saying, hey, i uh, got the mark of the beast coming in a few years, why don't you take it in your right hand your forehead? And you're going, no way, I'm not doing that. So the devil cannot come in just straight at you and tell you, hey, we got, we got some guys out here that's going to give you the mark in the van out here. Why don't you come out here and get it? You and bring your family too. No, I'm not doing that. Okay? He's got, that's the truth. He's got to pull people, bewitch them away from the truth in order to take that mark. But also, remember the idea that everything in the subconscious, where all these devils can talk to people, they're all locked up down there. They can't get out. They need someone to open the door for them. They need someone to create a portal. Remember what CERN, I think CERN's up to. Opening a doorway, a portal. Drugs are the, that's why I call it chemical sorcery. It's a form of witchcraft, but it's based upon drugs. It's getting you to open the mind. Remember in Revelation chapter 9. These locusts that come up with the dreadlocks and the faces of men come out of the smoke. They used to be in a pit, locked up in the sub areas. That's where they are. And they want out of there. And in your mind, the way to get that out of there is to make the sober part of your brain go to sleep. Drugs or alcohol will make you sleepy. And then you, after you come down off the high, now you're going to go to sleep. So the Bible teaches us, as Bible-believing Christians, to be sober and to gird up the loins of our mind. That means have the truth. The, how do we fight the principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places? By having our loins girded about with truth. So it's the truth that girds us up and makes us ready to meet off and to, and to defend ourselves against any of these false doctrines. But someone comes in to bewitch you and pulls you away from the truth so that you'll accept these new age concepts. You'll, so you'll open the door. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see what he's, he's, he put them both there. Gird up the loins of your mind, and be sober. What does sobriety mean? It means girding up the loins of your mind. It means that having everything in an order, not just all willy-nilly all over the place, everything is in order. Everything is right. Everything is complete. Everything is being held together. That's what that's talking about. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. So what happens when you're not sober? The opposite of everything that I just said happens. The Bible tells us to be sober. Whether it's alcohol, marijuana, methamphetamine, heroin, LSD, crack, you name it, ecstasy, whatever it is, it is the opposite of sobriety. And Christ told us, we're going to keep the door closed. We're going to have you conscious. We're going to have you awake. 
We're going to have you thinking. We're going to have you walking circumspectly, looking around you to make sure there's no danger approaching. That's what watchmen on the wall do. Do you, th do you if somebody in the military was told to stand guard over something and they get drunk while they're standing there, do you think the military is going, oh, look, he's drunk. And that's, that's nice. He's had a hard day. Let him drink. Are you okay? Can you watch all of gold here at Fort Knox? Can you do that? No, they don't do that. If he's drunk, you throw him out. You put somebody in there that's not going to go to sleep. Because if he goes to sleep, the thief's going to come in to steal and destroy. Romans 12, 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think how? Soberly. According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Then down in verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Every place in the Bible that talks about how our mind should operate, it tells us to be awake and watch, and it tells us to be sober. So whether it's Rodney Howard Brown or somebody else going to hit you on the head, give you this new age Shakti pot on your forehead, slay your spirit, and tell you, oh, you're going to be drunk now in the Holy Spirit. Oh, if you're not drunk, you're not right with God. Everybody get drunk now. Benny Hinn, Kenneth Hagin, who's now dead. Ah. These guys tell everybody, be drunk, be drunk, be drunk. So whether it's a drunken spirit or it's drunken reality by way of alcohol or drugs, the intended purpose is to make drunk the mind so that the watchman would go to sleep. The critical functions of your brain that say, I'm not drinking that, I'm not touching that, I'm not going over there. The critical functions of your brain are all asleep. Now here comes the lion. Titus 2.11, For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Here the Bible's teaching us that the grace of God that brings salvation, think of the four Gospels, think of the whole of the Bible, the grace of God bringing us salvation, teaching us to be sober. If someone comes in the name of Christ and teaches you to be drunk, they are trying to bewitch you to take away the truth from you. That's what they're doing. Someone hands you a joint. They're trying to trick you. They're trying to take away the truth from you. Someone hands you a whiskey glass or a beer can. They're, that's what's going on. It's an effort to bewitch you so that the truth will not stay in your mind. Put down the consciousness. Try to put you to sleep. So watch this. 1 Peter 4, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Does that kind of answer the question, what lion they were referring to in Rastafarianism? If it's the lion that says, roar, smoke a joint, then you know that it's not the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's the devil, our adversary, the roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. See, here Christ, God, has connected it for us. Sobriety, you know who the lion of the tribe of Judah is and you're going to follow him. And he's not roaring against you, he's a roaring against everybody that is against you. Become drunk, high, altered state of your consciousness, altered state of your awareness. Rather than looking around you to see the dangers around you, you are looking in. All this time that you're looking here, there is a devil out here walking to and fro as a roaring lion. And he's been looking for you all day to devour you. You never saw him coming. Because the witchcraft, you were bewitched, and now you're looking to yourself as your savior. 
I mean, think about what Paul was dealing with. Paul was dealing with witchcraft in the Galatian church in that they, they said, ah, you got to draw the circle, you got to be circumcised in order to be, you know what they were doing? They were looking to themselves and what they did in their flesh to save them. They were not looking to Christ to save them. They were introspective. I must bring about my own salvation by drawing the circle of circumcision. Paul nailed it when he called it witchcraft. John 10, verse 1. Here, now watch this. Think of, and we've used this illustration about, you know, Christ the shepherd and the sheep. He's, you know, going to guard the flock and everything like that. I want you to put this in the perspective of your brain and how it functions. Think of the logical centers of your brain being critical and only letting stuff in that's good and not letting stuff in that's bad. I want you to think about that, all right, as we read this narrative from Jesus. Here's Jesus describing, and this can be applied as a church. As a church, I, it is my responsibility to guard this church against false... It's my responsibility to not let someone come in and bewitch my people to cause them to disobey the truth of the gospel. It's my job as the husband and the dad of my family to make sure that no one comes in and bewitches my family by pulling them away from the truth. That's my job. It's the job of my own self to guard against someone bewitching me to teach me false doctrine. So watch what, watch what Jesus taught. John chapter 10 verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, a porter is in, is in control of portals. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Now watch this, okay? Let me do, okay, here is... Uh, here is the cosmic serpent, and you got to get drunk with drugs to see him. And he, Jesus describes here, he says, um, um, I, if, if anybody comes in by the door, that's the shepherd. What does Jesus say? Behold, I stand where? At the door. And I kick it in like, you know, John Wayne or something. No, it's not what he does. He knocks. He gets your attention. Who is it? It's Jesus Christ. I'd like to come in and save your soul and have fellowship with you. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, because it's your door, and you, with your decisions and your conscious, sober mind, make the decision to let Jesus in. It's your free will. Jesus never kicks the door in. And he never comes in some other way. Never. So he stands at the door and knocks. You have to open the door and let him in. Jesus said, that's me. A thief doesn't knock. A thief doesn't use the front door. The thief, and it, no, I just, the language of the King James Bible. Someone sent this to me and said, Pastor, did you ever notice that he said, climbeth up? <gasps> wow. Let me, uh, let me show you this. You know what Freemasonry is all about? Climbing the ladder. Climbing the ladder. Do you know what uh, the Aquarian Conspiracy is all about? It's about Kundalini telling you you have a snake you have a snake, the base of your spine, and he wants, he wants to climb the ladder of your 33 bones in your spine and come in through the back door into your pineal gland. That's what that's about. I'm telling you, this Bible is right. Jesus was warning us about this. So he says, he that entereth in not by the door in the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way. That's what they're telling you to do. Climb up. Climb the ladder. Come on. Get up here. Climb, 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 climb. These guys climb in some other way. They don't come in through the door. They come in a different way. Whew. 
That's the thief and a robber. They're, they're there to, and I'll show you the scripture, they're there to destroy. He that is in, in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the, the porter, you know. When, Jesus, when this Bible talks, you know it's the truth. And you know how this Bible talks. These and thou's and ephes at the end of words, right? Thou sayest it. Thou hath done this. We know what the King James Bible sounds like, don't we? So we're, you know, we're listening. We flip it over to some radio station. You hear a guy, sounds like he's talking about Jesus, right? And I said, now in your, in your Bible, it says this. It says, um, the one and only Son, Jesus Christ. And wait a minute. And you're going, wait a minute. Uh, no. That's not King James. He's not the one and only Son. He's the only begotten Son. I ain't letting that in. I ain't believing that. But you'll, your porter will open the door to the shepherd because you know his voice. You know what he sounds like. Isn't this, isn't this Bible neat, isn't it? Isn't it right? So then he says, Mark 13, verse 34, For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants to do every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning. Four times. Do you see that? Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. What I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. So he says the porter has to stay awake and watching. And he said, You be sober. You have your mind right. Because um, if he comes suddenly and finds you sleeping, you're in trouble. So don't be drunk. Don't take the drugs. Don't smoke the joint. Don't do anything like that. The Bible's telling you to be sober. Now watch this, okay? Here it is, Isaiah 7, 6. We're going to look at some scripture, and I'm going to show you. Think of your mind. Think of there's a big wall around the consciousness of your mind. And you only let in what you know is truth. So the thief is going to come in some other way. Maybe there is a window open. Or there's a breach in the wall. So, or the porter's asleep. Remember, remember what we learned last week. Delilah made Samson go to sleep on her knees. What'd they do? Cut his locks off. Now he has no power. Took the power away from him. She bewitched him so that he would not obey the truth. And the truth was his strength. It was the word of God. So watch this now. There's a verse in Isaiah. It's going to show you what all this is about. Isaiah 7, 6. Let us go up against Judah. Judah's the fourth, of, uh, fourth son, by the way. And vex it. Let us make a breach therein for us and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Now, think about, think about a city that has a king over it. And the king dies, who's going to rule the city? Usually it's his son. So, here's the city, and they're saying, it's Judah, it's the fourth, they're saying that they're going to come in, not through the front door, because the king would say, get these people out of here, kill them. They want to be king. They want to overthrow the city. Kill those guys. So they know they can't come in through the front door. They've got to come in some other way. So they vex it. You know what vexation is? Vexation is uh, Lot was vexed with what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, it was just constantly pounding and working on him and working against him over and over and over again until Lot finally said, oh, I've got to get out of here. Angels, which way do we go? <clears throat> so watch this. Oh, by the way, that was Lot. Lot made it. His weaker half didn't. Think about that. Anyway, so the goal is they can't come in through the portal, through the front door. The, front, the guy at the front door, the doorman, will not let them in because he knows, uh-uh, no, I know these guys. They're not supposed to be in here. They're going to try to set up another king. So they vex it, and they make a breach in the wall through alcohol, drugs, meditation, so that this new king comes in 
Now he's ruling over the throne of your mind. That's, that's what that is. That's what's going on. Uh, there's an interesting aspect to all this. Remember, we're calling it chemical sorcery. We're still dealing with the power of witchcraft. And there's something that I kind of caught on to. And I see a connection with it in the scripture. Witches, if I, if I use the word witches brew, you get this idea in your mind of old hag witches standing over this big black cauldron on a fire. Here's a graphic of it here, okay? What are they doing? They're mixing up, mixing up some magical potion, eye of newt and bat wing and uh, skin underneath the fingernail of a cow or, some, you know, whatever, some oddball stuff like that, okay? That's all make-believe stuff. But do witches actually brew things? Well, you remember that uh, stuff that they drank down in South America? The vines, the ayahuasca. They take the vines that looks like serpents, they put it in a pot, and they boil it. They seethe it in a cauldron until all of that stuff is extracted into that, and then they drink it. Uh, what else you see here is making methamphetamine. How do they make meth? In a cauldron. Whether it's the mind-altering psychedelic drug that allows the shamans to see the two snakes coiled together, brewing that in a cauldron, or the guy in Jefferson County. Jefferson County is number two as far as meth labs in the whole country. Whether it's a guy out in the backwoods with, uh, what do they use, uh, ammonia, propane, um, what else are they stealing? Uh, cold medicine, mixing that all together in a cauldron to produce the sorcerer's brew of methamphetamine. How do guys do heroin? A spoon acts as a cauldron. The little tar goes on the spoon, you take your lighter, you melt it down, you've got yourself a witch's bruise, what you've got. You inject that into your body. Now you're in a new consciousness, a new awareness, you have a new awakening. Or you could be like that Hoffman guy, that actor, who on the 33rd day of the year, at 46 years of age, was killed by the witch's brew. The needle was still in his arm, he took an overdose. Listen, if that guy could say anything, uh, who was it, Seymour Hoffman, if that guy could come back to this world and say anything, he would say that witch's brew, that sorcerer's chemicals, had so much power over me and it took my life away. He will tell you that that stuff has power. He's been in rehab. He's like all these other rock stars and movie stars. Have been at, uh, Chris Farley, brilliant comedian. I liked his comedy. Life was cut off for what? Drugs. Can't get away from them. They hold power over people. This is the witch's brew cooked in the cauldron that holds power over people. And they can't get away from it. Uh, I've mentioned Silver Ravenwolf, one of her books, To Stir a Magic Cauldron, A Witch's Guide to Casting and Conjuring. So we, uh, we have this idea that witches make chemicals. They make a brew, they make some, some sort of liquid or something that performs magic. It enhances you as far as love or knowledge or just opens up your consciousness. That is chemical Sorcery, witches, brew. Want to know the interesting thing about the King James Bible that all these other Bibles hate? It actually has the word cauldron in it. So I went and looked it up. You ready? 2 Kings 4.38 and, and Elisha came again to Gilgal. And there was a dearth in the land. And the sons of the prophets were sitting before him and he said unto his servant, set on the great pot, and I'm going to show you the connection between a pot and a cauldron here in a little bit, set on the great pot and seethe pottage for the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild 
vine. Stop right here. Remember back a couple videos ago, that vine, remember what uh, the Aya Hauska looks like? It's a vine that twines itself together like serpents. Remember in Deuteronomy, God said, their vine is not as our vine. Our vine is Jesus, and, and it produces the, the cluster of grapes. And Isaiah said, new wine is found in the cluster. New wine is unfermented wine. Won't make you drunk. It'll lighten your body. You know why? Because it's full of sugar. It's full of sugar and good things, and you eat that stuff, and boy, you can just, you know, hey, you're alive, man, because you got some fresh sugar in your bloodstream, all right? But old wine will make you drunk. And, and Moses said, through the inspiration of God, he said, their vine is not as our vine, for their vine is the vine of Sodom, and their grapes are the clusters of bitterness and gall. Now, I'm going to show you the connection here in a little bit. But here are these sons of the prophets. They went to Bible college, didn't they? Sons of the prophets found a wild vine, and they didn't know what it was. And gathered thereof wild gourds his lap full, and came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. And so they poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass, as they were eating of the pottage, that they cried out and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat thereof. You see, there was something in these gourds from that vine that was poisonous to them. Poisonous. And they knew they couldn't eat it. There's death in here. We cannot eat that. There is. Um, go back and watch um, uh, which Bible you be the judge. And I show you the two vines. The book is from the vine of Sodom. There's death in this cauldron. Remember, this book is designed to bewitch you and pull you away from this book. See it? You, you don't believe that. Go to, go to any of these churches. Count how many times they reference other translations of the Bible against the King James Bible. If they ever use a verse out of the King James Bible, it's only because it says what they want it to say. But nine times, if they put ten verses of Scripture up on the screen, nine of them are going to be out of any other translation other than the King James. They want you away from this book. So that's witchcraft. And here the prophets found a vine, put it in the soup, found out that it was poison. So now watch this. Job 41.1. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? So Job 41 is talking about Leviathan, which is the serpent, the dragon. Job 41.20. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke. As out of a seething pot or cauldron. Think, now I'm going to give you some verses. There's the cauldron. And a cauldron seeds this wild vine, this gourd, this, this medicine. It's going to open up your consciousness. Think of the craze of marijuana and the smoke of it. What does that smoke do. Think about that. Jeremiah 1 13. The word of the Lord came unto me the second time saying, what seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot and the face thereof is toward the north. Verse 14. Then the Lord said unto me out of the north and evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah. And I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me, and have burned incense, their smoke there, unto other gods, and worship the works of their own hands. What was the cauldron a symbol of? Facing the north, the cauldron, the seething pot, was a symbol of the evil army that's coming out of the north. Remember um, in Joel, it's the north army, that God's mighty army. No, not the, the, um, the Todd Bentley crowd. It's these devils in Revelation chapter 9. It's the fourth kingdom that mingles themselves with the, the seed or the DNA of men coming out of the north, rising up out of what? The smoke. Isaiah 14, 31, Howl, O gate, cry, O city, 
Thou whole Palestina art dissolved, for there shall come from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in his appointed times. I think that these verses that talk about, like in, in Revelation 9 and in here, there's something about that smoke. Remember, let's, let's look at it. Let's do the contrast here. Christ is coming down from heaven in a what? A cloud. Clouds are made of water. Water is always a, a symbol of the word of God. Ephesians chapter 5, Christ washes his bride with the water by his word. Paul said, I plant, seed is the word. Apollos watereth, water is the word. God bringeth the increase. So here's Christ coming in the clouds, which is water vapor. Cool, nice, refreshing. Here is Antichrist coming up out of what? The smoke. You see it? You see all these people with the marijuana and the smoke, and they don't chew the marijuana, they don't eat it, they what? Burn it so they can inhale and exhale the smoke. And what's in the smoke? The mind-altering substance, the, the thing that's going to open up their third eye, their awareness. It's coming out of the smoke, isn't it? And here in Isaiah 14, there shall come from the north a smoke. None shall be alone in his appointed times. Revelation 9, 17, here it is. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth, and, of, and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. And out of the, See, that's Rastafarianism. And out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Revelation 18, 18. And cried when they saw what? The smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? Remember Babylon. We looked at this last time, about the masculine and feminine part of your brain. Babylon represents the creative, intuitive side, and Babylon becomes a smoke. Babylon, we're going to see a verse, Babylon makes people drunk. Back in Deuteronomy 32, I just referenced this a while ago concerning the, the wild gourds that they found. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is what? The poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? You know, something that I was starting to look at a little bit, I just ran out of time in my studies. But I had heard from people, and I read a few in, uh, accounts on the internet, especially those in India, that some of the serpents over there, some people would just let the snakes bite them. Why? Because in certain, I think, um, certain of the serpents or the snakes over in India, What's the ones where the thing comes out the side there? I drew a blank. But anyway, the venom of certain of these serpents has hallucinogenic properties. They do it because it makes them drunk. Let's go back and look at the languages. Remember the vine of Sodom. Remember the, the strange vine that they, couldn't, that they didn't know what it was. They took the gourds and they shredded it. And they seethed it in the cauldron. They were making the brew, as it were. All right? God said that their grapes are grapes of gall and their clusters are bitter. Now, and their wine is the poison of dragons. Remember that word poison. That's why the prophets could not eat that, of that vine because it was poison. There's death in the pot, death in the pot. Think of venom. Venom is poisonous. Okay, think of all the chemicals that you put in to make methamphetamine. If you separate them out and take them one by one, you're going to die. It's poison. It's what it is. It is absolute poison. Even in meth and in crystal meth form, you've seen the pictures. Go Google it. What people turn out to look like after years of methamphetamine abuse. It kills them. Teeth all rotted out, sores all over the body. It's killing people. It's poison is what it is. But it makes you high on the way. It's going to be worth it, isn't it? If I'm going to die, I'm going to die drunk. That's how people are these days. That's why they're doing so much of this stuff. But I'm trying to make the connection here. The vine of Sodom 
the poison. The grapes, the clusters are gall and they're bitter. Now I'm going to show you a connection here. There is actually a, a hallucinogenic drug that is actually mentioned in the King James Bible. It's associated with bitterness and gall. Know what it is? I'm going to get to it in a minute. Numbers 21, 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Think of, think of poison. Think of being drunk with that poison. The serpents went forth. You know what this was about? In Numbers 21, they were murmuring and complaining against God. They turned their back on God. They said, we don't want God anymore. He's brought us out here to die. You know what God did? God released fiery serpents in among them to bite them. Stop and look at our country, our society, all over the world. You know what's happening? Since people are turning their backs on God, God's releasing the serpents everywhere. That's why this world is becoming drug crazed. And I would even say, I haven't done much research on this yet. I would even say certain of the prescribed, not all of them, I don't believe that, but certain of the prescribed drugs end up being poison. And why? People turn their back on God. People turn their back on the book. He sent his word and healed them. They've turned their back on God. God is sending the serpents in amongst mankind right now, biting them and poisoning them. Then look at verse uh, Numbers 21.8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now this is, this is what I like. This is cool about my King James Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. It's the fourth book of the Bible. And here we have serpents going out, poisoning everybody with their venom, bitterness, and drunkenness, and all of that stuff. So we have Moses lifting up a serpent on the pole, and if they look upon that, they live. That was in the fourth book of the Old Testament. Let's go to the fourth book of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke. John, the fourth gospel. Do you remember? Do you know the connection already? John 3, 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You know what the antidote to poison is? The Word of God. Jesus, the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God, was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The antidote to the poison of the serpents. Here's why I'm saying this. Those of you who are under the power of certain drugs, there is an antidote to your drug habit. It's the Word of God. God heals and saves drunkards, dopers, and sinners alike. How did He do it? His death on the cross. That's how He accomplished it. Now watch this. We're gonna, I'm going to show you the connection. I mentioned this poisonous thing, the vine of Sodom, the gall, the clusters of, of, um, of bitterness. And there's something associated with gall and bitterness in the scriptures. It's called wormwood. And in case you didn't know this, wormwood is a hallucinogenic drug. In case you didn't know, I didn't know that. I found that out a couple years ago. And I was putting all this together, and I'm going, are there drugs in the Bible? Yep, there are. 
So we can take um, everything that we've learned so far, marijuana, all of the other drugs. Let's look at what the Bible says about drugs through what he says about wormwood, which is the poison of serpents. Let's look at the Bible. Deuteronomy 29, 18. Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe, four things, whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of, those, of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. Stop right here. The two vines. Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and my words abide in you, the same shall bring forth much fruit. And you know what that is? It's the new wine in the clusters. Isn't that beautiful? It never makes anybody drunk. It gives them life. It gives them vitality. It brings them joy in their life. New wine does. Mm. And all of this is spiritual, people. It is all spiritually connected. And so God says, let's be among you whose heart turneth away from the Lord God to serve the other God, lest there be among you a root or a root that beareth gall and wormwood. That vine is the vine of Sodom, and it bears gall and wormwood. Rather than a church being part of the vine of Jesus Christ and sharing the gospel from the pure word of God with everybody, now we've got a vine of Sodom that all it does is make people drunk in bitterness. Mm -mm -mm. Jeremiah 9.15, you're going to say, the Bible actually says that wormwood makes you drunk, and wormwood is a hallucinogenic. So the connection between marijuana and alcohol in the scriptures, one and the same. By the way, if you've ever smelt Marijuana that has a very leafy, bitter smell. Now, I'm not saying that marijuana now is the wormwood in the Bible. I'm not saying that. We, I know that there are two different things. But think of the bitterness of the smoke. That's the connection. Jeremiah 9, 15. There, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood, and give them water of gall, to drink. And he says in 23.15, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood and make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. You know what that is? The drug, the, um, the overtaking of society by drugs. That is God sending this to mankind to put him into a drunken state. Because you know what he said about Babylon, Jeremiah 50, I think, or 51? He said, I'm just going to make them all drunk. That way they'll never know what's coming. You see that happening right now? I do. I absolutely do. Whether it's done in church services, whether it's done in homes, whether it's done in Colorado, Washington, whether it's done in Washington, D.C., the whole idea is Babylon is going to make everybody drunk and they won't see the coming day of the Lord. They're too drunk. God said, I'm going to feed them with wormwood. I'm going to give them that bitter drink, and I'm going to make them drunken with it. Lamentations 3, 6. Let me, let me stop right here. Lamentations 3. Not, I haven't studied the rest of the book of Lamentations. I've read it several times. I haven't studied it with the idea that Lamentations, all of Lamentations deals with the Antichrist. But in Lamentations chapter 3, I've, I've used this several times in the last couple months because it dawned on me that in Lamentations 3, it looks like it's describing the beast who is locked in the prison and can't get out. Look at this. Lamentations chapter 3, which has 66 verses in it. He hath set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. Think of DNA and what it looks like. Also when I cry and shout, he shutteth out my prayer. He hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He hath made my paths crooked. Think of a prayer labyrinth. Think of, watch this. That's crooked, isn't it? 
DNA is crooked. It's twisted. Study the word crooked in the King James Bible. I should have done that. Study the word crooked in the King James Bible. You can get a copy of our free software, King James Pure Bible Search. Go to purebiblesearch.com. Download a free copy of it. Study things that are crooked. Okay? Well, this Bible's right. Uh, made my paths crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He hath made me desolate. He hath bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. And then he says in verse 15, He hath filled me with bitterness and hath made me drunken with wormwood. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. Think of Ash Wednesday. And thou hast, think of the phoenix, and thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forget prosperity, and I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord, remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall. He made him drunk with wormwood. And you take wormwood, I don't know exactly how they do it, but I think you, I think you extract the oils out of it into some sort of, you're using a cauldron, you're doing witchcraft, making a cauldron, boiling the oils out of it or whatever, concentrate it down some, and then you drink it. They call it absinthe. And there are bitter liquors that have wormwood in it. But there are people who tell of using straight wormwood, absinthe, as an hallucinogenic. One guy read even... He uses wormwood so he can get in contact with the aliens, the ascended masters, the spirit guides. Because when he's not drunk, he can't talk to them. He can only do it when he's drunk with wormwood. Same with cannabis, same with LSD, same that it opens the door, it lets the snakes come in some other way. That's how they do. And remember, whoever does that, that's the thief. They're coming to kill and to destroy. Amos chapter 5, verse 5. But seek not Bethel, nor enter into Gilgal, and pass not to Beersheba. For Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to naught. Look, i got to stop right here. Uh, this is Bethel Church. God has brought us to this Bible. This, actually, this church started on this Bible. I was going to be the idiot to take it away. God chastened me. And God strengthened this church and established this church on the words that are in this book. There's another Bethel church. It's in Redding, California. I call it the anti-Bethel. They are so far removed from this book, it's not even funny. The witchcraft that goes on there, the altered states of consciousness, the drunkenness, is every where think of that let me read this again bethel shall come to naught seek the lord and ye shall live lest he break out like fire in the house of joseph and devour it and there be none to quench it in bethel ye who turn judgment to wormwood and leave off righteousness in the earth here's judgment thy word that read psalm 119 it's full of thy judgments thy statutes thy word they're true here is judgment. Here is the true, unchangeable word of God, the straight path. God turned that church over, that Bethel church in Redding, California. God turned that over to wormwood. Drunkenness. Oh, we don't need the Bible. Woo, we got the spirit right here. Think of, uh, oh my goodness, I should have put this guy in my notes. Um, I can't think of his name right now. But he talks about token the ghost, man. Ooh, we're going to have some um, hallelujah marijuana or something like that. Okay? This guy's crazy. He is equating being filled with the Spirit like drunk people and like those who smoke marijuana. This guy has been made drunk by the Spirit of Wormwood. And he doesn't know the truth. Revelation 8.10. Watch this now. God says, I'm going to turn this whole world over to wormwood. Revelation 8.10. The third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning 
as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the rivers became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Here's a picture of Wormwood, and you concentrate it into this liquor form called absinthe. Okay? And so God, and think of now, think of what stars represent in the Bible. Spirits or angels. And I'm telling you, there is a vast spiritual connection between alcohol, mind-altering drugs. I'm not talking about cholesterol medicine. Mind-altering drugs, consciousness-expanding drugs, psychedelics, entheogens. There's a connection between these things and spirits. And they are bewitching mankind and removing them away from the truth of the Word of God. God said in 2 Thessalonians 2, because they love not the truth, God, uh, uh, God shall send them strong what? Delusion. You know what someone who is delusional is? They're seeing things that aren't there. They're not real. They're hallucinating. It's, it's not an illusion. It is a delusion. It's taking away their ability to see things the right way. Absinthe, wormwood, marijuana, LSD, you name it. It takes away that kind of drunkenness, alcohol drunkenness. You don't see things. Drunks doing a field sobriety test cannot see, think, or walk a straight line. They walk lines that look like this. That's the lines that they walk. The spiritual connection. Here's God, the Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. The alternate spirit to that, and we've discussed this many times, Mystery Babylon the Great. She is the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, and she is depicted as, in the book of Proverbs, the strange woman, the harlot woman. The strange woman um, waits for the young man to come by so she can talk him into you know, being with her for money. Now, I don't worry about it. My husband's gone. We won't get caught. It's very dark. No one knows you're here. Secret sins. Get it? Okay? But here's what the Bible says about the strange woman and what she does to people. Book of Proverbs chapter 5, verse 3. For the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Do you see that? She talks... Like a honeycomb. Honey is a picture of the Word of God. Okay? Um, her tongue is a two-edged sword. Thank God we have something that's sharper than a two-edged sword. That's what Paul said. Okay? But she starts out sounding good, but her end is absinthe, wormwood, drunkenness, and it's bitter. And unless you should ponder this book and think of it, she cast a bewitching spell on you to make you drunk so that you don't know what a straight line is. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Whew. This Bible's right. She is called in Nahum chapter 3, Behold, because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcraft. Think about, think about what happens to a family when alcohol and drugs take over. Talk to anybody who works for Child Protective Services, Family Services. Talk to anybody who works that and they'll tell you. In your opinion, what do alcohol and drugs do to the American family? They'll tell you horror stories. And all of this was done by the mistress of witchcrafts, mystery, Babylon the Great, whose end is drunkenness and wormwood. Revelation 18, 23. 
And the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and, the, and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, and for by thy sorceries, thy sorceries were all nations deceived. I want you to think about that word. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So we know that Mystery Babylon's sorcery is what deceives the nations. Back in Revelation 17, it gives you an idea of what that sorcery is all about. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admira admiration. God had said earlier that what was in this cup she has made the nations drunk. She made them mad. She made them out of her mind. They are hallucinating. They're having strong delusions in their drunken state. And Mystery Babylon holds a cup, a cauldron. She holds a pot where she makes the nations of the world drunk. And she deceives mankind with her sorceries. Now, I'm going to get into something that it's, I, I just happen to know this, and some of you who have done the research know this. Now, I have, a, I have a record of never altering the words that are in this book. I don't change them, ever. But I like to study words. I like to find out where our words come from. A lot of the words in the English language come from the Greek language, cardiac. The Greek word for heart is cardiac, pneumonia. The Greek word for breath is pneumos. That's where we get pneumonia, pneumatic tools, things that are driven by air. You know where we got the word pharmacy from? Look it up. Etymology online. I, use, I have that website on speed dial. Because I like to look at words and find out where they came from and what, what's up with them. And there's a reason why I'm doing this. Because back in Revelation 18, For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. We've seen it manifested both in here and in the scriptures. That there's something being stirred up and mixed up in that cauldron. Witches make chemicals. They make things in the cauldron that make people drunk. That's how they get their magic. So here was, here was uh, Francis Crick. He was basically drinking or taking what was stirred up in the cauldron of witchcraft so he could see the serpents dancing around one another. Deoxyribonucleic acid. So now watch this. Here's what the word pharmacy comes from. And I, 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 I didn't mention this. I didn't say this yet. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. I just happen to know, I mean, I know this. The Greek word that is rendered as sorceries, and I believe this sorceries is the right word, beyond any doubt. But the Greek word here is pharmakia. It is where we get the word pharmacy. Let's see if there is a connection between sorcery and pharmakia, because I believe this Bible's right in everything it says. Let's look at the word pharmacy. A medicine, from an old French pharmacy, purgative. From medieval Latin pharmacia, from Greek pharmakia, use of drugs, medicines, potions, or spells. See, the King James is right. Poisoning, witchcraft, remedy, cure. From pharmakius, which is another Greek word, a preparer of drugs, poisoner, or sorcerer. They got it right. The translators saw the word, knew what, was, knew what it was, knew what it was about, knew that Babylon was the mistress of witchcraft, and they saw the Greek word pharmakia or pharmakos or whatever, whatever form it was in, 
And they all agreed, 54 men in a circular fashion, I believe being led by the Holy Spirit, put the word sorceries there because they knew what it was. They knew that witches and sorcerers, God knows that witches and sorcerers, God knows that these drugs that are out there, be it wormwood or whatever it is, something cooked in the cauldron, who is it that takes these drugs out in the Amazon basin? The medicine men, the witch doctors. Universally, there has always been a connection between sorcery, witchcraft, and drugs. It's always been there. Here's what was interesting to me about looking at the etymology of the word pharmacy. From pharmacist, a preparer of drugs, a sorcerer, or a poisoner. Go back to Deuteronomy 32. Their vine is the vine of Sodom, the poison of serpents, the clusters of gall and bitterness, the, the drunken poison of serpents, of asps. Is marijuana poison? Absolutely. It's mind poison. Look at Job 20, verse 5. The, the triumphing, it's talking about the triumphing of the wicked. And then it says in verse 16, He shall suck the poison of asps. The viper's tongue shall slay him. Psalm 58, 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. You know what he's saying here? He said the wicked people are being turned over to what? Poison. And they themselves are poisonous. Poison and wormwood and the serpent's bite, making people drunk. It all is part and parcel of the same thing. Psalm 140, verse 1, Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Continually they are gathered together for war. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. Romans 3, 11, There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way and are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Do you remember? You remember Culture Club? Boy George? Ugh. You remember the album they had called The Church of the What? Poisoned mind, witchcraft, sorcery, drugs, chemicals, things cooked in the cauldron like methamphetamine and all these other potions and heroin and things like that, cooked up witchcraft by way of the drugs and the chemicals and the liquor, poisoning the mind, thus bewitching mankind and removing him far away from the truth. Think of um, the serpent's poison. And we know, we, we know for a fact, some people say, I think the serpent in Eve, you know, you know, the Bible doesn't say that, so I don't believe it. One thing I do know for a fact the serpent did. His poison were his words that came out of his mouth, went into Eve, poisoned her mind, and changed her perspective to where she no longer wants the truth that her husband gives her. That's exactly what's going on in this world right now. Chemical sorcery, altering the minds of men, poisoning them against the knowledge of the truth. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2. I said in mine heart, Go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this is also as vanity. I said of laughter it is mad, and of mirth what doeth it? I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. You know what Solomon did? Solomon, for a while in his life, turned over his life to one big, giant, 40-year-long party. Pleasure and joy and the mad. You know what mad means? It doesn't mean, hey, I'm mad at you. I'm going to hurt you. Mad means crazy out of your mind. Wine will do that. Um, 
Marijuana will do that. Make you out of your mind. LSD will do that. Cocaine will do that. They will make you mad. They will make you out of your mind. And Solomon said, I did it, and it's vanity. It turns into a waste. It is nothing. Oh, by the way, while Solomon was drinking up all this wine, he had a thousand women at his beck and call, and they were making him build high places to fertility goddesses. See how it worked? I believe Solomon came around at the end of his life. That's why he's writing the book of Ecclesiastes. I believe he came around, and I believe the promises of God that God did not remove his mercy from Solomon. But there was a time in Solomon's life, sounds a lot like me and you, when the poison of the devil was making us mad, and we weren't thinking straight. Isaiah 56, 9, All ye beasts of the field, come to devour. Yea, all ye beasts in the forest, his watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs that cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough, and they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, one for his gain from his quarter. Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow shall be as this day and much more abundant. This is describing... The generation of people that live right now, they want to live for the now, for the moment. Seize the moment. Seize the day. Let's party now. Let's get some wine and strong drink and let's get, bring a bag of pot with you. Let's just dope our minds up because tomorrow we just might die. We have nothing to live for anyway. And our mind has been so pulled away from the scriptures. I don't believe in God anymore. I don't believe God's going to hurt me. So this world just makes itself drunk with liquor, wormwood, potions cooked up in a cauldron to raise your consciousness. Isaiah 47, 7. Thou says, this, is, this, this describes the party generation, the drug-crazed party generation. Thou saidst, I shall be a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things to thy heart, neither didst thou remember the latter end of it. Therefore hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures... Thou that dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thine heart, I am and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. But these two things sh shall come to thee in a moment in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon thee in their perfection for the multitude of thy sorceries and for the great abundance of thine enchantments. Wine, pleasure, living for yourself, Sorceries, chemical sorcery, drugs, alcohol. Deuteronomy 21.20. They shall say unto the elders of this city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Step and think about. I mean, when I was growing up, I've already mentioned this. Drugs and alcohol were in my little lower middle class subdivision. Kids my age, 13 years old. I, would, I walked up on a kid one time, he was 13 years old. He was out puking his guts out, just, just out in the woods a little bit. I thought he was bad and sick. You know what I found out? He, he was drunk. 13 years old, he was drunk. Kids in my neighborhood drinking beer, alcohol that they got from their parents, doing drugs, in some cases marijuana that they got from their parents. And you've got kids all over the country now. Um, you have a generation of young people between the ages of 18 and let's say 23 that are very good at cheating urine drug tests because these employers now know they got to do random drug tests of their employees because they're probably taking drugs and they can fire them on the spot if they do and so these people are really good at bypassing the test so they they cannot find the marijuana in their system so we have a generation of young people that doesn't want to work they don't want to do anything they want to sit around and eat junk food play video games watch TV make out and get drunk and get high. That's, 
That's America. Doesn't matter if you live in the city or you live out in the country. See, marijuana started out in the city in San Francisco and all of us good country people, oh, they don't smoke marijuana in Muskogee. They do now. And our whole generation that we're raising up in this country, they are not going to be able to stay away from drugs or alcohol. God said they're worthy to be stoned. That word stone doesn't mean, yeah, let's get high, man. No. The stone cut without hands, Daniel chapter 2, the fourth kingdom, destroying them. Deuteronomy 29, 19, And it came to pass when he heareth the words of this curse that he blessed himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of mine heart, to add drunkenness to thirst. You, you get away from the word of God, and you go get drunk. Job 12, 24, He taketh away the heart of the chief of the people of the earth, and causeth them to wander in a wilderness where there is no way. They grope in the dark without light, and he maketh them to stagger like a drunken man. Isaiah 29, 9, Stay yourselves and wonder, cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. Isaiah 63, 6, And I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Again, the Bible is telling you that all of this, all this, um, uh, Colorado and Washington allowing people to smoke marijuana just to have fun that's a judgment it's not a blessing it's not oh finally we're free I'm telling you it's a judgment from God he is pouring out the staggering spirit of drunkenness Jeremiah 51 7 Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken the nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. Jeremiah 51, 37, And Babylon shall become a heaps, a dwelling place for dragons, an astonishment and a hissing without inhabitant. They shall roar together like lions, they shall yell as lions whelps. In their heat I will make their feast and will make them drunken, that they may rejoice and sleep a perpetual sleep, and not wake, saith the Lord. And I will bring them down like lambs to the slaughter, like rams with he goats. You know what God's going to do to Babylon? Here's, here's, what ha here's what a lifetime spent of drinking and doing drugs is that God turns your mind, not in all cases, bless God, some people are being saved out of it, but God turns that man's mind into a dwelling place for who? Dragons. You see, the breach came in. You let down the wall of sobriety, and now the dragons just moved right in. The spirits moved in. And this is why these people think the way they do about political issues and moral issues and Bible-related issues. They don't get it because they have so much spirits in them that as soon as you give him a Bible verse, the devil does what he does in Mark chapter 4. He just gobbles it up and it's gone. Jeremiah 51, 57, And I will make drunk her princes and her wise men, her captains and her rulers and her mighty men, and they shall sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake, saith the, saith the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Nahum 1, verse 9, What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble, fully dry. There is one that come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Notice God said he came out of them. The wicked counselor. That is the opposite of Christ who is the wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The exact opposite of that. And so God's going to pour out a spirit of drunkenness in this world, and he's doing it through alcohol and through drugs. Luke 21, 34. Take heed to yourselves, lest any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares, for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. You know what I, I really think the devil's doing? And I know God's pouring this out, but the devil is trying to make everybody just drunk enough so that they don't see the coming of the Lord as being imminent. They're not aware of the seasons and the times going on around them. And they're not perceiving 
that the judgment and the wrath of Almighty God is probably nearer than any of us can possibly fathom, but especially those who are drunk. And that's what Jesus said. Be careful. Don't, don't go off into drunkenness and, and all the cares of this life so that they, that day does not come upon you unawares. Remember, be sober, be vigilant, for you ever say the devil. And God's going to pour out a spirit of drunkenness on this earth, wormwood and drunkenness and the spirit of Antichrist. And nobody's, they're not going to know what hit them. Romans 13, 13, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. 1 Corinthians 5.11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. 1 Corinthians 6.10, Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5.21, Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. When somebody says to you, Hey, Come over to my house. We're going to party. When you were five, that meant cake and ice cream and punch and pin the tail. That's what it meant when you were five. That was, so, that was the innocent days. Now if you hear of 16-year-olds saying, Hey, got to, we're going to party at my mom and dad's place. They're going to be gone for the weekend. We know for a fact alcohol and drugs are going to be there and people ending up in bedrooms together. We know that for a fact. And God said, this kind of crowd, these, these revelers, they do not inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot be a drunkard or a dopehead and inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah, I do believe in some cases that God does do things in his time with people. No doubt in my mind about it. There were things that my mom and dad struggled with in their life. And as, the, as I saw God have patience with them, I saw God move in their lives. And now these issues are gone. My dad's in heaven now. Issues in my life. I never dealt with drugs and alcohol. But over time, God has had patience with me and mercy with me. And if you find yourself in a situation where, yes, you believe Jesus is your Savior, but you're battling these things, whether it's alcohol or drugs, cry out unto the Lord and wait for God to pull you out. Because I promise you, He will. He will not leave you as a drunkard or a dopehead. He will not leave you that way. He always leaves us, He always makes us better than we were before. Um, Romans 12, 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according to as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. He said, Be sober. Titus 2, 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of, thy, of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ. The Holy Spirit does not teach us to be a Rastafarian and that the truth can be found in the smoke. It's not teach us that. It teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. It teaches us to walk and live soberly. Because I think there's going to come a time there's going to be two Jesuses. There were two trees in the garden. There was Jesus and Barabbas set before Israel. And I believe there's, there's going to be a choice, a universal choice. Those who are sober are going to choose the right Jesus. Many of you already have. Those who are drunk, you're going to choose the wrong one. You're going to be high-minded and you're not going to get the right Jesus. 
and that's at the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1.13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. 1 Peter 4, 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Yeah, I used to, people would say, yeah, I used to drink. Yeah, I used to do drugs. I knew a guy that came out of drugs and alcohol and lots of things. And we were friends for a while. He used to crave the old stuff. He used to tell me about all the drugs he did, him and his brother. He's back in it. What a shame. What a shame. He fashioned himself now according to the former lusts that he had. 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren, that are in the world. He's telling us to not be drunk, but be sober and resist all of that, resist that lion. How? By being steadfast. That means standing fast and not moving in what? Faith. I believe and trust the work of Jesus Christ and I believe every word of this book. And I'm not going to let either physical or spiritual marijuana, either one, to bring me to drunkenness and bewitch me that I let go of the one thing that is going to save me in the last days. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light, and children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, are drunken in the night." Now look at Deuteronomy 29.6. You have not eaten bread, neither have you drunk wine or strong drink, that you might know that I am the Lord your God. Let me put all this together for you. Everything we've looked at. This Paul, uh, Paul said, Who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Alcohol, marijuana, LSD, meth, all of these drugs. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. All of these drugs, my brother-in-law, who spent a lifetime on both alcohol and drugs. He's in heaven now. Not, not because he was a drunk or, a, or took drugs, and he did. He took this, if, if it was there to smoke or drink or shoot, he did it. And I knew him, and I loved him, and I knew that he was going to split hell wide open in that state. And I asked God to let me visit with him before he died because he had COPD and he was, he was dying. It was pretty bad. God actually worked it out to where he moved up this area and he started coming to church. And I mean coming to church. When you see me doing Pastor Mike online, that room that I sit in, my brother-in-law built literally about a month before he died. Because he got sober, walked away from the alcohol, walked away from the drugs, his wife kicked him out, and he had nothing. And it was then that God really began to deal with him. And he came to me five days, five days before he died. Sunday morning, he said, Mike, he said, I just want to know that if I died, I'm going to heaven. And I told him, Steve, it sounded like to me you already know. You, are, you already are. I can tell the Spirit of God is all over you. And we prayed. And five days later, God took him in his sleep in the middle of the night. Boy, that's sweet. I love God for saving my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law did things that, to be honest, I kind of wanted to do. I'm glad I didn't. 
But God can save the worst alcoholic and the worst drunk in the world. And all the time that he was doing drugs and all the time that he was on doing alcohol and everything else, I'd try to witness him in just a brick wall. I remember taking a tape over to his house one time, and he saw it. He said, Mike Hoggard, get that out of here. He said, I'm telling you, I'm not listening to it. I said, Steve, I've got to leave it here. He said, well, I'm going to throw it away as soon as you walk out. I said, you can do what you want to with it, but I've got to leave it here. And I left it there. See, all the time that he was on the drugs and the, and the liquor, he did not know who God, you know what I heard him say? First time I ever met him before we started working, before I married Lisa, was on visitation. He said, I believe my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. I go to the lake a lot. I'm closer to God at the lake than I am in any church. That was a long time ago. And it was the drugs and the alcohol talking. But when he became sober, he realized that it was God's way or hell. And he chose God's way. And he is in heaven right now. Because he's quit drinking wine and strong drink. He became sober. He became a child of the day rather than a child of the night. And God took him in great peace. And he knew who the Lord God was. That's the testimony of the guy who built the room where I do Pastor Mike online. He told me, he said, and I woke up one morning just, you know what? Why don't we make this little room? And I'll, I didn't even have an idea what I was going to do with it then. But God laid it on my heart to do it. And I said, you know what? Steve has asked me if there's anything around here he could do, he would do. Steve was pretty good at drywall and carpentry and things like that. So I called him. You want to do this for me? He said, I'd love to, Alder. He came over and he built that room. He died a month later. And God has used that room to help a lot of people in life. I hope Steve knows that. Because God took someone who was under the power of chemical witchcraft and brought him to the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, I listen, I, I knew Steve. I knew him. And I'm, he was as bullheaded and stubborn, hard-hearted and mean and nasty as anybody I've ever known in my life. And if God can save him, God can save you. I promise you. Ask God to save you. Ask Him to get those spirits out of your life so they have no more power over you. Ask God to save you. And I believe He will. This is Pastor Mike. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.